In my last video, I showed you my latest small form factor PC using a 10729 13900H ES motherboard, and it was perfect in just about every way, except for the fact that it overheated. Today, we're gonna try to fix that. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So today we are going to revisit this small form factor PC. Like I said in the intro, I've got a 13900H engineering sample motherboard, and with the current cooling configuration with the Be Quiet BK034, it actually overheated on me a little bit, and I think may have prevented me from reaching its max turbo speed, at least in sustained workloads. In the previous video, I went over all the relevant performance metrics, and you can click right up here if you want to catch that one. But in short, it would turbo for between 20 and 30 seconds, reaching 5.4 gigahertz on its performance cores and 4 gigahertz on the efficiency cores. Somewhere in that time period, though, it would reach 104 degrees Celsius on a couple of the cores, and then automatically throttle itself down. Now, this motherboard and CPU combo is actually unlocked from the factory. It has an unlocked turbo timer, meaning that as long as you have adequate cooling, it will keep the maximum performance possible. But this tiny little Be Quiet cooler wasn't adequate enough. And in fact, from our 105 watt peak, it actually throttled itself down to about 80 watts for sustained workloads. Now that was still plenty fine to get very good performance in gaming, but I wanna know if adding a larger cooler to this will extend that turbo timer even further. On the table in front of me is a pair of CPU coolers, and I actually did purchase these. This is the ID Cooling IS40 and the ID Cooling IS55. As their names imply, these are actually 40 and 55 millimeters tall. That's really important in this particular small form factor build, as we have a triple Y graphics card installed in the Fractal Design Terra. The CPU cooler is pretty much limited by the height of the IO shield, maybe a little bit more. So we're gonna be pushing it installing the IS55. I bought the IS40 just in case we can't get both components to fit equally well. Now the center frame in the Fractal Design Terra can move side to side, so we do have a little bit of wiggle room available. However, if you notice, I also have some Oiloi DDR4 memory installed with a heat spreader on it. The IS55 is designed to go over the top of standard height memory inside of the system, so if I install the IS55, I'm also gonna have to swap out the memory. Keep that in mind if you're building a similar system for yourself. So for today, I think I'm gonna go ahead and install the IS40X and see where that gets us. I'm hoping the addition of four heat pipes with the same size fan gets us some better results at 105 watts. Uh, if not, I might have to bite the bullet and go with the IS55, if it'll even fit, and if I have another kit of memory that will fit underneath it. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back. So I did a couple of things inside of this box. Number one, obviously I did swap out from the BK034 to the ID Cooling IS40X. Now, this cooler does have a pair of heat pipes. It kind of snakes its way in an S that goes through the cooler like this. Uh, you can see them if you look through the ribs, they're just very difficult to see. It does have a copper cold plate. It does have direct contact heat pipes. This should have been a good enough cooler. I was hoping though that with four heat pipes also being direct contact, that the IS40 would be better. Another modification that I did was add a small shim in between the cold plate cooler and the CPU itself. 
Uh, this has a heat spreader on top of the mobile CPU die that is soldered to the motherboard. It's a much different configuration than a standard CPU socket. Now, when I first got this board, it did have a backing plate on it that was supposed to be designed for 10729's own designed or own supplied CPU cooler. They ended up not supplying that CPU cooler, and so the backing plate was not compatible with any other LGA 1700 mounts. Removing the backing plate from the motherboard, I noticed that the cold contact plate on top of the mobile die wasn't exactly tight. The screws would bottom out before they really applied a lot of pressure to it. So I figured adding even just a small washer would add just that slight amount of pressure that the back plate did, maybe solidifying my CPU performance. So first off, in heavy load, I didn't even get 15 seconds into the test before we started thermal throttling. And for reference, my room is sitting right around 24 to 25 degrees Celsius, pretty much identical to the tests that I ran last week on this system. But even more than that, I'm seeing some thermal throttling on more cores than I was before. If you remember back to the last video, P-Core number three was pretty much always my hottest core, running up to 104 degrees Celsius, but none of the other cores really ever approached 100 degrees. In this test, however, I am seeing loads hit 100 degrees Celsius on multiple P-Cores. That's also backed up by the fact that when I did a 10 minute stress test on the BK034, we saw about a 79 watt overall package power. That is 79 watts on average over 10 minutes. With the IS30, we average just 71 watts, meaning we are clocking lower and using less overall power because this cooler doesn't stand up to the heat. Even more interesting, let's go ahead and take a look at 3 d Mark Time Spy Extreme. Now, for reference, I did benchmark this even before I did last week's video, so I already had some numbers on hand with no configuration changes whatsoever. And as you can see, in the new test, we're actually slower. Our overall score dropped by 5.6%. However, our CPU score dropped by 18.8% and an additional 15.8% in overall latency per frame. That is a massive difference and backed up by the results that I got in the heavy load extended test. So I think it's safe to say that either adding the shim or switching from the BK034 to the IS40 didn't net me the results that I wanted. So at this point, I think all we can do is take the system back apart. I think I'm going to try removing the CPU shim, reapplying thermal paste, and seeing if that helps our situation at all. Beyond that, I think we're going to have to go to a larger cooler, because neither one of these so far is standing up to the 105 watt thermal range of the 13900H. All right, I'll see you in another 20 minutes. Or hell, maybe we could just try getting proper contact between the IS-40 and the motherboard cold plate. Uh, there's no contact at all. Wow. <laughs> I don't know how that's even possible. But uh, it didn't even spread the thermal paste. Amazingly enough, that only resulted in a 15% drop in performance. I don't know how that's even possible. But... Uh, here we are. Um, cool. All right. Let's see what we can do about that. All right. After probably 10 or 15 minutes sitting here puzzling, uh, the IS-40 is not going to work on this board. My shims on the cold plate here had no effect on the height of the cold plate. It just applied a little bit more pressure. There are standoffs that contact the motherboard on the top side, so it can only go down so far. That was my first worry, was that I had sunk the cold plate down a millimeter and avoided contact. That's not the issue. What is the issue is the mounting bracket on the IS-40 itself. These mounting pegs don't actually sink through the motherboard. They're meant to make contact with the motherboard, which means the height difference between the bottom of the peg and the bottom of the cold plate is set in stone. You can't modify that. These are bottoming out on the motherboard before the cold plate makes contact with the motherboard IHS. If it was the other way, I could add shims between here and the motherboard and lift the CPU cooler. Unfortunately, I need to get this closer to the motherboard and 
I don't have a way to do that without taking a hacksaw to these and then hoping I get them level. Uh, so I don't think this cooler is going to work on this board. I will say when I pulled the Be Quiet cooler off of there, this did make very good contact. But obviously this felt a little bit short of my expectations. So I don't know that I want to go back to this. I think I'm going to try going with the IS-55. That is going to mean swapping out my memory for another kit. I think I have another kit of DDR4 around here. Um, I'm not sure what speed though. I'm not sure if I have any more 3600 around. But hopefully the IS-55 is able to make good contact. The other thing that I'm worried about is the IS-55 actually fitting with that triple slot graphics card. Again, I can only move the frame so much. I don't have much more leverage or much more room between the side of the case and the graphics card. So let's go ahead and try to get the IS-55 on here, get some new memory in, shift the center frame over, and see if that works. So yeah, right about 20 minutes later, as you can see, all the panels on this case do indeed close. But man, oh man, is it tight. The IS-55 and a 2.75 slot graphics card is all you can fit in here. There is absolutely no room to spare anywhere. I, I think both the graphics card and the CPU fan are within two millimeters of touching the case. So no one can claim I didn't cram as much power as humanly possible into this box. Now, a couple concessions had to be made. Well, one major concession, and that is the memory. The memory had to go. Uh, so this is again, an Oloi set of 3600 DDR4. I wanted to keep a set of 3600. I wanted to keep 32 gigabytes. Unfortunately, I don't have any memory that's 3,600 megatransfers per second that doesn't have a heat spreader on it. And I wasn't willing to remove one right this second. The only set of 32 gig that I had was a set of 2,666. So we kept the capacity, but we went down significantly in speed. Will that matter now that we have 105 watts worth of CPU cooling? Well, there's only one way to find out. So let's go ahead and fire this thing up and see how it does. All right, so there we go. 32 gigabytes of 2667 DDR4. Uh, good enough for me. Let's save it. Let's get into Windows. How in the world did we already trigger a thermal throttle event? It says our max temp has been 79C across all cores, and that's just on boot. I will say our idle temps have dropped dramatically. Uh, we were idling somewhere in the low 40s, we're into the bottom 30s, maybe even high 20s on some of these cores. Let's see if that continues. All right, here we go with heavy load. Let's see what it does. I can already tell you that is dramatically different. Immediately jumping to 110 watts of package power, we're sitting at 95 watts right now. And our boost clocks are higher than we had on the BK034. That's exciting news. But look at our CPU temps. Average CPU temps, 68 degrees Celsius. We are hitting 80 degrees right there. 73, 77, 78, 82. Man, P core three isn't even our hottest core anymore. And our efficiency cores are in the mid 60s. Still holding 95 watts and we are well over 30 seconds into this test now. I'm excited for what that might mean. I could let this go for 10 minutes. I don't think I need to. And here's another crazy thing. On both the other coolers, obviously the IS-40, but on the Be Quiet, on the 034, this thing got so hot you didn't want to touch it. This is about room temperature. This is cool to the touch now. That is crazy. Over two minutes in, still holding 95 watts. No change in our cores at all. 
Efficiency core sitting right about 3 to 3.1 gigahertz. Performance core sitting at 4.3. Even on the, the Be Quiet, when this leveled out at about 79 watts, we were seeing between 3.6 and 4.1. So we're seeing 4.3 on all six of our performance cores now. That's a substantial improvement. All right, I don't think there's any reason to let this go a full 10 minutes. Let's, uh, let's see what 3D Mark Firestrike does. Did we improve our CPU performance and is it actually noticeable in games? Let's find out. All right, drum roll and not quite the result I expected here. Uh, here are the results of all three tests. On the far left side, we have uh, the IS-55. In the middle, we have the IS-40. And on the far right, we have the Be Quiet, BK-034. Now we know the BK-034 was thermal throttling and dropping to roughly 80 watts of max power uh, through sustained workloads. We know that the IS-40 was not making contact with the uh, motherboard uh, IHS. And we know that the IS-55 is making contact and can sustain 95 watts pretty much indefinitely. And in fact, during my testing here in TimeSpy, we see the same thing. So why is it that the Be Quiet still outperformed the IS-55 in TimeSpy? I don't know. Now I will say the margins in TimeSpy between the BK-034 and the IS-55 are very, very slim to almost be within a margin of error. But it's still a result that the BK-034 outperformed the IS-55 in every test, despite having a lower overall TDP. But there is one other test I wanted to run, and I wanted to do this one live as to not skew my results at all. Uh, I did run Cinemench R15 on the BK-034 on the same day that I did my original testing. Uh, and we got a result of 26.09. Uh, but let's go ahead and run this now. Let's keep an eye on our uh, CPU clocks here. I'm In fact, I'm going to go ahead and reset this so we can see what our max and what our averages are. So I'm going to click on Reset and let's run our multi-threaded test. All right, immediately we drop down to 95 watts, 3.7 gigahertz looks like on the performance cores and 2.8 gigahertz on the efficiency cores. And that seems pretty consistent. And we improve our score by just a couple of points, 2627 to 2609. Let's run that a couple of more times. But I don't think that's gonna be much different. Yeah, 3.7, 2.8 pretty consistently here. Twenty six thirty seven, slightly higher. I will say our CPU package power is still hitting into the 90s and is triggering a thermal throttle event. So we are seeing some throttling going on. Yeah, 2630, 1% faster. In fact, 2%. 2609 to 2650, that's about what, 1.7% difference? 1.5, 1.6%? Yeah, about a 2% differential. The nice thing is this fan is actually running quieter and the system overall is running cooler and we are sustaining that 95 watt TDP. It's not really changing the results though. I mean, 75 watts versus 95 watts, that is a big difference when it comes to power consumption but I don't know that it's actually leading to any real world gains. Uh, let's go ahead and run through Time Spy Extreme one more time just to see if my first result was a little skewed. Maybe a Windows update was running or something, but I don't think it was. I just don't think that the two to 300 megahertz is making that big of a difference. All right, one more test run and the results are basically the same. We are within a margin of error. We're within 1.7% uh, CPU score and CPU test latency or render time. I'm still a little baffled as how these are so close because this CPU cooler did not perform it nearly as well as the IS-55, but on this architecture, temperature and boost clock may not be everything. We've seen... We've seen examples like this, like the Tesla P4, which is a drastically undercut version of the GTX 1080, uh, scoring within a couple percentage points, even though it's only a 75 watt card versus 
220 watts of dissipation. It just goes to show that you need to test everything. You need to test to see what your actual performance will be. Now I will say, I'm glad I've made the upgrade to the IS-55. And in fact, this is probably going to become my new primary gaming machine. This, I absolutely love the performance of. I played on it for an entire weekend at PDX LAN and the one complaint was just really how hot it got. With the IS-55, that's not gonna be a problem anymore. But it also really didn't increase the performance like I was expecting it to. I will say the larger fan on the IS-55 and the larger profile does have some other added benefits though. There's not a lot of airflow in the motherboard chamber on this case. And while this CPU cooler, the BK034, does blow air down at the motherboard, it's very limited as far as what it's covering. It's basically gonna cool the VRM and not much else. Having a larger CPU fan that actually overhangs both the NVMe slot and the memory as well as the VRM, this is going to provide better overall system cooling than the BK034 is. So, I'm happy I upgraded, and I think that's going to wrap it up for today's video. Let me know what you guys think down in the video description. I kind of like doing a lot of these live tests like this. Uh, and this is one where the results frankly shocked me. I expected to get some better performance, but in the end, really didn't outside of it's a little bit quieter and runs slightly cooler. As always, if you're interested in any of the parts from today's video, I will have affiliate links down in the video description. Make sure to go give those a look. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on social media at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you're interested in the things you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider going over to craftcomputing.store, picking up one of our pint glasses or our brand new coasters inspired by the 2011 Socket Xeons. That's going to do for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. I don't recommend this tea lukewarm. It needs to be hot or it needs to be cold. Beverage for today is not a beer, it's not coffee, it's not even alcoholic. I'm going with some tea today. Uh, this is Lapsang Sochong. It is a Chinese black tea. And if you believe Patrick Stewart uh, was the tea he wanted Jean-Luc Picard to drink instead of Earl Grey. It is a much bolder, much darker, uh, and what I like to call the scotch drinker's tea. It is piney. It is smoky. Uh, it's just good. Also beware, it is extraordinarily strong. Uh, I added two teaspoons to a 16 ounce mug, and that is more than plenty. Uh, I'm actually even going to set a timer. I don't like steeping this for more than about four to five minutes. Uh, so you've been warned. <laughs> I don't like boiling water with this tea. I like a uh, little bit below that. I've got mine at 180 degrees and that seems to be right where I like it. And we're gonna go five minutes. Timer so I don't forget. Cool. Well, I'm here literally watching this go. I figured I might as well review the tea. I love this stuff. This is so good. This is my tea of choice. When it comes to teas, I do generally prefer black teas, but Lapsing Sochong in particular, like I said, it's kind of a scotch drinker's tea. It's almost peaty in its smokiness. It smells almost like a campfire when you're, when you're pouring it and you're steeping it. And it's just such this rich, enjoyable drink. If you haven't given this a shot and you're looking for, you know, I use this as a locale alternative to uh, drinking hot cider and, and other, you know, the hot beverages. There's not much to it. And hey, it saves a lot on buying scotch.